and welcome to Literary Conversations Across Borders. And welcome to uh, Literary Conversations Across Borders. Uh, welcome to Literary Conversations Across Borders. Hello and welcome to this wonderful event entitled Literary Conversations Across Borders. What a series this is. We have had so many wonderful subjects to talk about. We've had science, we've had religion, we've had the environment, we've had global politics, we've had poetry. Let's face it, there's going to be real talk of what, what people are already referring to as de-globalization. We need uh, women to be empowered uh, globally. I believe that we are passing through a transitional period. People have now learned what the world could be like and should be like. They, they will be extremely reluctant to return to the old polluted ways. We need to really rethink what we're doing to the environment, what we're doing to ourselves. People at the end of the day, they're the ones that are creating the demand, the, the pull. So they're the ones that are going to the supermarkets, they're choosing the foods. The good side like good faith does not have the answer to everything. Science is based on inquiry, and inquiry depends on never knowing for certain. You always want to find out more. Uh, the power of curiosity, uh, as Leslie has said, and the power of doubt, um, uh, and, and, the, and the idea that there are multiple ways of seeing the same truth uh, would be very, very useful within, within uh, any religion in the 21st century. Because I could never even put a hundred words together in the right. I can't give you a hundred words, instead I'll give you 255, here's 200, just because in 55 for good measure for every time you said my words wouldn't take me anywhere. Race was not a factor, they said. He said it looked like a demon. It charged me. This is the story about the rising truth. When you feel closed in, simply raise the roof. From the day we leave to the day we arrive, we were born to survive, born to stay alive. Fake news has become more and more sophisticated. It's an industry, right? When there's so much disinformation out there and misinformation that um, it makes our role more important. We are privileged to witness a truly historic event. A historic event that will mark uh, the direction for this nation, for this state, but also for the region, for the Arab world, I believe, and internationally for many years to come. There is absolutely no reason to think that we are alone or we are the only ones that have been created. I would not be surprised that we will find someday some life form somewhere else of it. Art and culture is uh, always fired by the imagination. Uh, culture and the arts are what make us, as human beings, transcendent. The history of the UAE can be traced back to the Neolithic age. Where does fact meet fiction? And what is the responsibility of historians in ensuring that the true interpretation of events is portrayed? Saying of Sheikh Zayed, who founded the UAE, that a people that does not know its past cannot cope with the present or understand the future. And I think that that's very relevant today. History gives us all the time in the world to think. And it seems to me that history reminds us to remember to think better. Welcome everyone who's joining us today from more than 50 countries around the world, inviting us into your homes again for the last session of Literary Conversations Across Borders. What an amazing series it has been and we have a special treat for you tonight. Um, it's a particularly fitting, fitting question. How does reading great literature shape us? And I would like to give a huge welcome to Her Excellency Nora al Katbi, Minister of Culture and Youth, and president of Zaid University, and also to His Excellency Omar Saif Gabash, Assistant Minister for the Office of Public and Cultural Diplomacy, who will be sharing their own personal experiences of reading and what books mean to both of them. 
Um, please do post questions, any of you listening. Uh, we've had some pre-questions which are fascinating and take part in the polls that we'll be uh, sharing with you during this talk. You can listen in Arabic via simultaneous translation if you wish. Again, this is a first for the UAE, so uh, uh, what a series. Um, Your Excellency Nora, I'm going to start with you, ladies first, and ask, can you remember and tell us what was the first book you read on your own and got lost in the story? Thank you, Isabel. It's wonderful to be here and, uh, and honored also to be at a wonderful concluded uh, session uh, of the series of talks uh, with, uh, with Omar Gbash and yourself. Um, I do remember that, uh, first of all, um, studying and reading the school wasn't inspiring enough, uh, which made me uh, feel kind of an urge to check what my mom used to read. Um, I remember I was 13 or 14 years old um, when there was that a shelf of classic, her classic novels. Um, uh, and the first novel that I read alone was called uh, We Don't Sow Thrones, Nahnu La Nazra Shouk, by Yusuf Asibai. Um, he's an Egyptian uh, author and, uh, and used to be a minister of culture in the, the mid 70s during Sadat era. Um, and why that novel is, is it, was, it was because it was in my mom's library. I remember vividly the yellow shaded uh, pages with ridges uh, in the edges of, of, that, of that novel. Um, and that was back in the early 90s. And of course, it wasn't a suitable book for my age, um, which, I, you know, which I made sure that I hid from my mother. I, I didn't tell her, I didn't share with her that I'm reading her novel. Yet when she found out, um, she said, Noura, when you're done with it, we will watch the movie together. Um, so she encouraged me. Uh, and I remember a Friday night, we rented that VHS and watched the movie together. Reading it alone, I had this, um, this sense of a, of a rebellious, uh, you know, reading it without my mom knowing yet, again, at the same time, um, wanting to maybe live a world, a world that that she she's been you know uh, sometimes busy with uh, in her own library. That's well, absolutely wonderful, and um, I love the idea that you read a book that um, without anyone knowing about it. And uh, and books are a conversation between the writer and the reader, and no one else is in the middle. So, Your Excellency Omar Gabash, um, can you remember the first book you read on your own? Uh, I, I can't remember the first book I, I, I read on my own, so um, I, I'll make it up, if you don't mind. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was actually just thinking about it, um, and you know, the, the, the books are coming back to me now in the heat of the moment. I, I actually spend a lot of time reading adventure stories. Uh, detective stories, war stories, uh, you know, sort of adventurers in Africa. Uh, so there were the Hardy Boys I remember reading, and it was always, you know, there's some kind of strange mystery. Uh, and I've still got all of the books. I used to go to All Prince in Abu Dhabi uh, as a child. Uh, and essentially every weekend we'd be in All Prince. Once I finished all of the Hardy Boys, then moved on to Nancy Drew. Um, I think that was, you know, me being very open-minded. Um, you know, <laughs> girls could also be involved in strange mysteries. Finished Nancy Drew, moved on to Enid Blyton for some reason. Uh, but then there were two, two writers that I particularly loved uh, until the age of about 13, 14 also. Uh, Alistair MacLean. He used to write these absolutely brilliant books. Mm. Um, and I, I've, I've been trying to find them again, but they're a bit difficult to find. Uh, and then there was Wilbur Smith, um, who wrote a whole bunch of kind of um, a, a series of, of these families, these strong men who would grow up in Africa. Uh, of course, they were white men, but, uh, you know, I suppose that's not politically correct these days. And they would be looking for gold and, uh, and diamonds, and they would make their fortune, and then there would be you know, questions of revenge and love. Uh, and so that, yeah, that really inspired me. So there was nothing particularly profound about the books I was reading until, about, until I got to about 14. Then, then they got a little more, a little heavier. Um, uh, Nora, did you ever read any books at school that left um, uh, their sort of an impression on you? Because I know, uh, you know, a lot of students are put off by having to read a book, study a book, and then have an exam about it. And um, 
I do worry that that sometimes can take the joy of reading. So can you remember a book actually that you read during your sort of secondary school years that you enjoyed at school? Um, you know, I think, um, Isabel, what made me love reading is back during my school days, there wasn't that much of reading and going back. I studied in a government school. I mean, I, my early years was in a private school, yet then I moved to public schools and there wasn't that much of reading happening. Um, the peak of, of read happened maybe uh, after high school, uh, early, uh, I mean, university, post-university when I first graduated um, and heavily uh, during my summer breaks. So, um, and maybe that was that sense of because there was no connection between having to study and read a book because I'm going to be asked and, and write something about maybe that made me feel that it was an escape uh, that I always looked for uh, during uh, the summer holidays. Yes. Uh, Omar, what about you? Was there any books you studied at school that you look back on with affection and yeah. uh, fond memories? And, I, and again, I'm very tempted to uh, not to tell the truth because I've been trying to encourage my younger son to get on with studying uh, over the summer. Uh, but no, actually, I, I couldn't stand any of the books that we were given, primarily because uh, they, they didn't really mean very much to me at the time. Um, but there, there was one book that I've, I have come back to, and that, that is the book 1984. We read that at school, and it, I reread it uh, about four months ago uh, with 30 year, a 30-year gap. And and it, it, all of a sudden, it meant so many different things to me. And I think partly why is because you need a certain amount of life experience to be able to really understand uh, the power of these books. And 1984, uh, I, I actually wonder why they make kids read it um, at the age of 15 or 16. How much, uh, what, what kind of um, political sense do you have? Uh, and should you really be um, introduced to those very complex ideas at such an early age? Uh, you know, I learned all the answers um, and I figured out how to get a, a good grade in my exam. Um, but in, in itself, it didn't really leave much of an impression. Um, however, um, you know, it being a classic uh, and the fact that it was, it's always been identified as a classic uh, pulled me back to it. And, and again, as I say, having read it a few months ago, I can understand what a genius uh, George Orwell was. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think he is probably the best political writer ever. So mm. I read Like You when I was 16, 1984. But mm. unlike you, I absolutely, it, it has left uh, such an impression on it, on me for, the, for, for all my, I've read it many, many times since. But I have never got over the final part where... Winston Smith betrays Julia because of his utmost fear of rats. Yeah, and yeah. I have a terrible fear of rats. And I just felt, my goodness, mm -hmm. then I could betray someone I love because if they did that to me, the cage around your head with the rats, maybe mm -hmm. I would, I would, um, and it just was such, I, I was such an impressionable, impressionable teenager, I think. So, so certainly 1984 is one of my absolute must read. Nora, what do you think about that? Do you think um, that there's books we should try and protect teenagers from? Um, well, I'm against, I'm against trying to protect teenagers from whatever book they would like to uh, to read or I mean my, my I mean I, I, I read a book which was like you know 18 plus when I was I was 12 years old and um, and I think I mean going back to your point with with 1984 it's it's a book that I agree with Omar 100% is reading it during junior high isn't the same when we, re we read it five years ago or seven years ago um, Yet I think with with what's happening now with teenagers, it's 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 not just the books, it's the it's the videos, the podcasts, the Netflix. So there's it's limitless. Um, I mean, I mean, therefore, I feel it's important to encourage them to read whatever they want to read as long as they're reading. And I think that is the essence: is if you read, just read, and uh, and and we know. I mean, reading just takes you into more of a from a deep to a deeper sense of of getting involved in that piece of literature or book more than a 
podcast or more than a, on a Netflix uh, series. Um, Omar, Ray Bradbury said or wrote, you don't have to burn books to destroy a culture. You yeah. just have to get people to stop reading them. What do you think? I mean, uh, I think it's, it's such a valid, a valid statement today where there is so much to distract young people. There is a lot to distract young people. Uh, and the only thing I'd say, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't agree that you're destroying a culture. You're redirecting a culture in a certain sense. Um, people are looking for all kinds of stimulation. At one point, uh, books were the, you know, the main form of stimulation. Then you got TV, then you got, uh, then all of a sudden Netflix hit. And, you know, it's, it's even difficult for somebody who loves books to avoid the uh, almost addictive uh, pull of those, of those series. Um, and that's, that's what leads to, to binge watching. Um, but I also think it's uh, really important actually to begin to compare film. And I think, uh, Nora, you, you have a, a big background in film and, and uh, the media. To be able to compare the, the effect that film has with reading. And there was a time when I stopped reading a few years ago. I stopped reading fiction because I thought, well, you know, lightweight. I prefer to read um, uh, more serious um, nonfiction books. Uh, and if I want fiction, I watch a movie. And then one day I decided, I, well, I discovered I watched all of the movies on Emirates Airlines, so I got out a book and I realized that it was more powerful than a film because it was completely in my head. And, uh, you know, there's, um, there's a Hungarian-American um, psychologist who came up with the concept of flow about 20, 25 years ago, and that you get so caught up that everything else disappears and you are one with the, with the practice or the exercise that you're engaged in. And that's what I think books can do. Because you're actively engaged, it pulls you and you, you pull yourself through it, um, which, is, which is something that I think people who don't read uh, need to experience. They really need to know. And I always think, uh, don't discount a practice until you've actually done it. Uh, don't don't just sort of say no before you've actually experienced the full potential of it. Uh, and that's what I say about reading. And I know, you know, I, I met a guy uh, a year ago who is 30 years old, who is brilliant, who is very, very socially you know, sort of, uh, fluent. He's never read a book in his life. I was astounded. So what do you do in a world where we are producing culture having never read a, a book, having, n having no connection to the world, the, the references that literature provides us with? Uh, Your Excellency, Nora, you're going to have to answer this. <laughs> well, well, I mean, going to, to Omar's uh, point with, with films and books, I, I mean, definitely. I mean, if you tasted, uh, you know, the flavor of, of reading books and, and getting into it just induces the level of imagination into a higher, you know, a higher limits than just watching a, a TV series or media. I mean, with, I, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm a film buff. Uh, definitely, I watched more than I read. Um, yet, um, I, I remember a book I read in the early 2000s, uh, uh, The Kite Runner by Khaled Hosseini. Oh. Um, it was a, for me, it was a, reading that book, it was, it, it, it was groundbreaking for me because I, I experienced Afghanistan uh, through a character. Have I ever been to Afghanistan? No. Uh, but yet there's this relevance between our culture and, uh, and you know, and, and, and different aspects of, of, uh, uh, of things that relates us. Um, so I remember we were spending, uh, it was out in the summer in 2003, we were spending uh, our summer holidays in DC, don't ask me why, uh, <laughs> and, there were, and there were more Afghani cuisines in DC than Abu Dhabi. Uh, yeah. I mean, like in one neighborhood, like there are tens of Afghani restaurants. And uh, allow me to read um, an, an excerpt from, from the book where uh, the main character get, got married and um, he says, I picture colorful platters of Chopin kebab, chalet uh, goshte, and wild orange rice. I see Baba between us on the sofa smiling. I remember the sweat-drenched men dancing the traditional atam in a circle, bouncing, spinning faster and faster with the feverish tempo of the tabla, until all but a few dropped out of a ring with exhaustion. So after that chapter, uh, I do demand that we go to an Afghani restaurant <laughs> to try an on and to try the orange rice, whatever food mentioned in Khalid Hussein's novel, uh, to complete my senses. You know, you have those senses and you want that smell sense and, 
and taste, uh, minus the man dancing. Um, uh, so in 2007, when, when the movie went out, um, uh, it wasn't so much as what I anticipated. Uh, definitely the book was, had more impact than the film itself. Um, so, I mean, just, you know, talking about a book and a film, yet maybe in other cases, uh, maybe the film is better, uh, yet uh, I, I think we are capable of pushing more boundaries than, uh, than one frame. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say that um, <clears throat> my favourite uh, book to film is The English Patient by Michael Ondaatje. So I read the book. Then I saw the film, then I read the book again. And although the film has a different ending, the, the filming in the desert and certain, the actors in it, I just, uh, it gave me a different sense when I read it again. So that was one thing. But one of my daughters, when she was 10, she'd read a, 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 an English classic book set in the Second World War called Goodnight, Mr. Tom, and she loved it. And so I thought for her birthday, we would get the video, a bit like when you watch with your mum, that we'd watch it. So we put the video in of the BBC, beautifully filmed, and she burst into tears. She said, that's not Mr. Tom, that's not the boy, because in her mind, she had pictured the characters so, so defined for her that they had destroyed what she'd read. And that was such a lesson to me that actually, this relationship between each reader and the writer is an individual. We bring to it our own experiences, our own ways. And um, a film director does that for us. But when we read it, it is very special and, and, and uh, just individual to us. So Omar, do you have a favorite book that's been made into a film that you either loved or hated? Well, I was going to say, um, just in response to what you said about the English patient, up until now, I thought we had so much in common. Uh, it turns out we don't. I, I tried to watch the movie. I, I couldn't get past 10 minutes. So I tried to read the book. I couldn't get past the first five pages. And then I went back to the movie and it didn't work for me. So uh. that's unfortunate. What I will say, though, I want to, I, 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 just to clarify, I think film is incredibly important because it can uh, indicate certain areas that, that we can explore. And I never used to like science fiction. I never understood it. Um, and then over the last few years, a number of science fiction movies came out, which were really profoundly philosophical. They asked very, very important questions. And they linked uh, the technology that we're facing in the world with, you know, stories of uh, the, the classic stories of, um, of fighting for freedom, for good, for the right. Uh, and it just occurred to me that for every science fiction movie out there, there are probably a thousand novels with the same quality of perception. Um, and so, so the movie directed me to science fiction. Um, and then, you know, th that allows me to, to, to explore the world of, of, of literature even more. Um, specifically, no, I mean, I, I tend not to, I tend to avoid watching films that also have a book. Um, because of because of that issue, it's either you know you're following the director's vision, uh, or you 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 read the book and then you um, you you find yourself face to face with something that is uh, a, a cheaper version of what you think is a profound experience. So it's it's very disappointing. There's a kind of dissonance there that that is unsettling. I have a question for our two wonderful panelists from Huda in the Netherlands, and Huda says, "How do you define great literature?" And what type of text do you feel, <coughs> excuse me, is particularly needed to shape modern Arab societies? Quite a deep question. Thank you, Vida. Oh. So, uh, Nora, please, can you, uh, so how do you define great literature? And what type of text do you feel is particularly needed to shape modern Arab societies? I mean, great literature is, I mean, definitely is the literature that, uh, is written hundreds of years ago and yet still relevant uh, from a uh, you know from a sociological from a, from from sociological from from economic perspective political pol political perspective from uh, philosophy and that kind of relevance is 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 too important for us and specifically maybe in our region and I'll, I'd like to just uh, allude to a personal experience. Um, I mean, there are things that you don't learn in schools or maybe aren't that much of discussed uh, uh, in, in our, you know, in, in, in our part of this world. Um, 
I mean, for me, reading Al Muqaddimah uh, for Ibn Khaldun uh, in the introduction is crucial. I mean, not just for anyone from the region, but just anyone. Uh, the relevance of human affairs and how it works is, is endless. Um, there's also this historical relevance that sometimes you, 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 do, you do need. And there are so answers that they weren't answered or answered in a way that didn't convince you. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the way uh, Leslie Hazelton, who's, you know, who, who appeared as a, as a guest and was with Umar in, in, in two sessions. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed your session, Umar, with her. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, so she delivers a story about the split of after the prophet, you know, the story of this epic split between Sunni and Shia. I mean, this book, this give you this background and this kind of an importance um, explanation that makes you respect the differences and not be with one side, you know, against the other. Um, you know, he, he, there's an excerpt from her book where she said, Ali was distanced to be the only man aside from Muhammad himself, whom both Sunni and Shia would acknowledge as a rightful leader of Islam. I mean, and here's the commonality between mm. us, the Sunnis yeah. and Shia, and just one, uh, you know, one small yet crucial paragraph. And I feel it's, um, I think we need to read more in philosophy. Um, I, you know, I, and we, we need just to um, understand that relevance of history around us and uh, nonfiction is, is important. Um, Fiction is important, but if we're talking about answers of our existence and our battles in the region, uh, I believe it's important to read of both sides, uh, the side that you think you're with or against. I think that's a really, really deep, deep answer. And um, Omar from Risha in the UAE, does a book have to be a great piece of literature in order to change your views of the world? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, you know, just as you, you, you can learn from um, you know, the most educated person as well as the least educated person, I think every book has the potential to um, nudge you in a, in a different direction to spark off uh, you know, neural circuits that are needed just a sentence or two. Um, I think uh, that, you know, the, 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 for me, the power of fiction is that um, you find people describing experiences in complex ways that make a sense to you immediately. So when you start off learning a language, you have basic descriptions, you know, color, uh, size, uh, shape, and so on. But when you get into the life of emotions and feelings and uh, perspective, uh, that's where literature really plays its role. And, um, you know, when I, when, when I had the previous question related to what should uh, we be reading in the Arab world, well, you, you know very well that we um, established uh, many years ago now the International Prize for Arabic Fiction. And that is a fantastic source uh, for um, a list of novels that young, uh, well, young, young Arabs should read. Um, th th there are 150 books generally on the on the long list, and then there's a short list of the best of that, which is a, another 16 books. There could there are gems in those books, and yet how many people actually read those books? Is it 5,000, 10,000 for a bestseller? In a world, uh, an Arab world of 400 million people, um, we really should be reading much more. And I think also it links in with one other question, which is very important, particularly in these days with COVID, is that. Um, Men mental health is very much uh, often um, an, a question of how you express yourself, and how you describe the world around you, and how you describe what you're feeling. And you don't necessarily have the ability to do that without the assistance of other people's perspectives. And you're going to get other people's perspectives and fantastic novels that are available in the Arabic language uh, at the press of a button. I, that's a really, really good point. And I can remember at the Literary Festival a couple of years ago. Uh, Sauda Sanusi, who wrote the prize winning from the International Prize for Maverick Fiction, The Bamboo yeah. Stalk, was sat yeah. with um, uh, a best selling English writer. Um, and she, she asked him, Oh, you know, I hear you've written a best selling book, and how many have you sold? 
50,000 copies. Yeah. She had written, it was Victoria Hislop, six million of her last book. Now, <laughs> that, is, that is such a shame because The Bamboo yeah. Stalk is all about identity. It is such yeah. a valid book for this, uh, uh, this day and age. And we do need to really, really get people reading IPAF shortlisted books, IPAF winners, and, and yeah. it's been going now. There is an amazing uh, diversity in books, mm. uh, in novels from that. So I think that's a really, really valid point across the Arab world. Yeah. Um, uh, Nora, why does humankind need stories? Why? Um, Big question. You're giving, Philosophical. You're, you're, you're giving Nora all the difficult questions. You, you noticed, Emma. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, whew, thank God. <laughs> I'm glad my AT is put on. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I mean, we need to escape. Uh, you know, we need to um, stimulate the way we think, uh, the way we look into things, the way we understand one another. Um, reading is so important. It just, it definitely provides you with that sense of empathy towards different cultures, different individuals. I mean, sometimes you read a book or you watch a film and you end up liking the villain more than the good people, you know? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that it's, it doesn't mean it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, you're allowed to, to like the bad person in a book. Or in, a, or in a movie, you're, you're allowed to do so because your imagination is, is boundless, is limitless. Um, and, and I feel, I feel that who doesn't read books um, is missing, I think is missing a total different universe. Uh, and I feel it's, for us, it's, uh, it's important, not just from a you know, psychological perspective, scientific, um, Work-wise, I mean, especially right now with with COVID, um, I, I mean, I've been reading more than more than before, more than ever, uh, and I've been enjoying it immensely. And you know, thanks to to such situation, uh, it just made me also maybe think differently, and uh, it makes you grounded. It makes you humble as well. Um, so yeah, and I, and I can go on and on and on about the importance of, 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 of reading. Yes. Um, can we have our first poll question up? I'm asking our wonderful host because I've totally forgotten about them. Okay. Uh, you can't judge a book by its cover, but you can judge a person by the books they read. Do you agree or disagree our audience? So, uh, we'll give you 15 seconds and Omar, I'm going to ask you, uh, yeah. regardless of what the poll says, what you think about this when we um, uh, get our result. Sure. Uh, oh, I thought I can answer. Sure. <laughs> uh, we can't answer. We're, 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 we're uh, uh, not allowed. We're muted on that. Okay. So 65% uh, say yes, they do uh, judge a person by the books they read. I think that's right. You can't. Yes. Yes, that's correct. So Omar, what do you yeah. think about if you um, if you went into a stranger's home, yeah. would you sneakily have a look at their books and decide what kind of person they are? Uh, well, first of all, I've tried the sneaky approach. It doesn't work because they can see what you're doing. Yeah, especially if you push them out of the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I always look at the books. I'm I'm always fascinated by that. Uh, you know, it's a reflection of the kind of structure of their mind, their interests. Uh, and also you've got to look at how well read and well thumbed those books are, because some of them aren't. Uh, some of them seem to be uh, occasionally, you know, there for, for, uh, for show, uh, which is okay, because also that, that clearly demonstrates that, you know, they find that books are important. Um, but just on the issue of uh, not judging a book by its cover, um, you've been to bookstores, uh, you've been to a lot of bookstores, and you know how much effort goes into making the cover. Uh, and I've bought a lot of books just because of the cover, and I haven't read them yet. Um, so, you know, there, there is a war there going on for the sale of books uh, based on what, what beautiful artwork they have on the front. I also think titles. Uh, I have bought books because they have got intriguing titles. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, a great title 
um, will definitely make me pick a book up um, yeah. because I'm just intrigued. So C.S. Lewis said, we read to know that we are not alone. Mm. Would, you, would, you, would you agree with that, Omar? Uh, yeah, I think that touches on the idea again of, of you know, sort of uh, psychological health. Um, we will never know another person's mind. We, uh, we put up so many different barriers. Um, there are so many different taboos and social constraints, uh, you know, complexes, uh, inhibitions, and securities. Um, and so um, when, every time you actually come into contact with another human being, there is potentially a power play at work. However, when you read a book, you, you're reading something where um, somebody has, has, has basically revealed their soul to you. And that's exactly when you think, I'm not alone. We, are, we, are, we do actually have so much in common. And then it's to look at how those, how those commonalities can actually be described. And I, as I say, I, I'm always so pleased when I come across just a simple phrase in a book. Uh, and if it's only that phrase that labels a feeling that I have gone through in life, I immediately feel a communion uh, with the writer of the book, but also with all the readers of that book. And that's, again, why I think young people should spend time reading, because it allows them to learn more about themselves by either recognizing or not recognizing phrases. Um, Nora, we have a, a question from Chi, uh, and she's asked, has reading, more so specifically literature, declined in appreciation with the rise of social media? Do you think that's had a, a, an impact on young people, particularly, I assume, uh, reading? Well, um, I don't have an, you know, the accurate data to answer if it's declining with young people, but it's not just young people. I think it's everyone. Yeah. Uh, I mean, with the pace of work, with the pace of the news flashes from, from social media, and um, as we mentioned, you know, the series and binging on Netflix, I think there is definitely a decline in reading worldwide. Um, and I'm sure that even while, I mean, studying 10 years ago or more, more than 10 years ago in and, and humanities and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, required people to read more. Uh, now, I, I don't think the sense of deep reading is there specifically in, in such institutions. So I, I, I think it's declining, declining due to such distractions. Um, um, and, and, and here's where, um, here's just kind of a, I don't, I don't want to call it a battle, but what can you do? I mean, how can you emphasize the importance with all of the fun and distractions? Mm. Difficult, really difficult. Carl Sagan um, uh, wrote, one glance at a book and you hear the voice of another person, perhaps someone dead for a thousand years. To read is to voyage through time. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that's true. Yeah. I mean, we read yeah. books that have been written such a long time ago, and yet we still find relevance. And I think, as you said, that communion, that, that, that sameness that we, we share. So uh, that I just hope everyone listening, the thousands of you tuning in, after this, please go and pick a book off your shelf and read you know reread it do something that is going to just help you um maybe if you if you had a habit of reading and you don't just just pick it up again so can i ask our host please uh, if we could have another poll question have you ever read a book which has changed you or made you see the world differently um so <laughs> let's vote on this uh, everyone and i'm going to ask both omar and nora the same question have you ever so you've got you've got 15 seconds to work out what to answer <laughs> oh yes 97 percent have have read a book that's changed or made you seem the world differently right so, I wanna know Omer, the, yes i want to know about the three percent who haven't been changed by <laughs> What's going on there? you guys need to speak to us Oh, yeah, the three percent that said no, send a question in. Let us know why. <laughs> we'll recommend a book to change you. So, Omar, starting yeah. with you, have, which book would you say you've read that's changed you, made you view the world differently? Just one uh, out of the many. Yeah, it's very difficult because I think every single book I read changes my view in in, in, a, in a certain way. I'm because I'm actively seeking new ways of looking at the world, new ways of organizing my knowledge and new ways of questioning what I already think I know. Um, 
the, the, there are a couple of books that have had a profound physical effect on me. Um, and, you know, I think you'll, you'll smile. Uh, again, they're not particularly deep, but Stephen King, uh, The Shining. Uh, mm. I know that the movie was horrifying, but the book, it, it crawled into me. And that was, I was terrified, absolutely terrified having, having read that. I think I was about 12 when I read it, um, which again just shows you the power of, of words on, on paper. Uh, really simple technology, really profound effect. Um, but there, you know, there are other books again, like 1984, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Crime and Punishment is a book that I keep coming back to. Um, I read it a little later in life, uh, when I was 28, and I read it the, the, on the same day. Um, so, I, you know, I started and finished on the same day, uh, and I was physically um, unnerved. Uh, I felt the dusty streets of St. Petersburg in the in the summer. Um, and, you know, you're in, very much in the mind of a person who has committed a terrible crime. Uh, and the paranoia uh, was absolutely gripping. So it, did it change? It changed my view of the world for a few moments. Um, it didn't reorganize my thinking, but it did change my immediate perception. And it was just the power of, of, of the word that did that. And Nora, have you, uh, would you like to share a book that maybe has changed your view of the world? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, many books did so, um, yet maybe with my current kind of memory, the, the few last books that I've read, um, I mean, definitely any book that Malcolm Gladwell writes do make you look differently into the world. I mean, he has this kind of, uh, he's the master when it comes to social changes and how he analyzes them. And his recent book, uh, Talking to Strangers, this, this interesting excerpt where he starts the book by saying, Sometimes the best conversations between st strangers allow the stranger to remain a stranger. Um, I, I, I do recommend this book. It's, uh, it's just, um, it's one of the books that makes you look, I mean, look at the world with a different perspective or maybe a, big, a, a better or wider perspective. Uh, another book is uh, by, but the Arabic version of uh, Gibran Khalil Gibran, uh, The Prophet, um, 1923. And currently, uh, due to current affairs, as well as uh, Amar mentions, you know, you just read a book to, to uh, have it, you know, with, with the experiences that we're witnessing throughout such times, is a collection of essays of uh, James Baldwin. Uh, yeah. I just yeah. understand more of the black experience in America. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, I, I certainly, <clears throat> as much as, uh, uh, we were talking a little bit before we went on air about books now that may be deemed inappropriate and Gone with the Wind was one of them. And um, uh, I can remember absolutely loving that book when I read it and in its own historical context. But then last year I read uh, Washington Black by S.C. Adjujian, which was written uh, from the view of a, of a little boy who was, who was a slave on a sugar, sugar plantation. It absolutely... I, when I think about it, I still feel the horror of human beings, of what a human being could do to another human being and live with themselves. So, so that, that book definitely changed me. And there was, there was so much in that book about, about relationships between a mother and a son, between someone who uh, was kind, someone who was unkind, someone who was horrific. Um, so you're left with those those changes about when you then think about things and that's why we need to read widely because if we read widely we can read differing opinions differing mm. uh, accounts of things and i think that was a really good point you made earlier on omar about the heroes in books before being white people or yeah. white men and how now that has is changing considerably and although it's late it is so important that young people see themselves in a book and see heroes and heroines that they can relate to. Um, and for girls particularly, it's really important. There are strong female characters in books. Uh, Nora, do you think, did you find that, that that was an important part of reading that you could identify sometimes with characters in a book? Yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely. It's just, uh, um, it's going back to, you know, what you read and does it define you? I mean, you know, sometimes when traveling, you know, back then when traveling was normal, I tend to want to check what's, you know, who's, you know, 
you know, what's uh, the people, I mean, the passengers next to me, what are they reading? And it's just, um, yet I, I encourage, I encourage reading, uh, I mean, everything to do fiction, nonfiction, histories, you know, social affairs, essays, collection of essays, even if you, they're not related to your culture, even if it's a, uh, a, a John Didion uh, kind of an you know collective of essays of yeah. you know the 60s in, in San Francisco or what's whatsoever I think you know sometimes it's it's that kind of uh, um, having a variety of characters you know it's just uh, it's it it makes you um, I mean going back to uh, Malcolm Gladwell of you know with different cultures there are different ways of um, reaction and, and action and uh, um, and and we tend to think that everyone would react the same uh, yet uh, it's uh, it's not the same and and I feel literature and do provide us with this that glimpse of understanding each one of each one another's culture and and and, and history and Omar do you um, uh, I, I hear both of you read different genre different types of books um, do either of you have a general recommendation, either a genre or books for our audience today um, mm -hmm. in Arabic or in English or in any language, really, or in translation? Uh, who would you like to go first? Omar. Omar. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to answer in, a, in a, an unfriendly way. I recommend, if you haven't read many books, uh, to go and buy a thousand books of all different sorts read through them and discover what you like and what you don't like, <laughs> all right? Once you've done that, you'll have a better idea of what literature and, and reading is about. I wouldn't recommend one book because there's, you know, things appeal to me and, and, and then fall out of favor uh, over the course of a few months. Uh, some, you, need, you, know, you need books in the way, say, you need nutrition. You, you know, if you're a vitamin C deficient, you'll want, uh, you'll want something that has vitamin C. If one day you wake up and all of a sudden you want bananas, well, that's, that's because you probably got a little potassium missing. And it's the, same with, it's the same with books. I mean, sometimes I throw myself into fiction uh, and sometimes I can't stand it. And I need to, I need to do, you know, the, the Malcolm Gladwell books um, because that gives me sustenance for, for the next period. And so I strongly recommend lots and lots of books before you make up your mind about reading. Nora. I agree with everything Omar said. <laughs> you can't buy a thousand books, just download them. <laughs> In the right way. Um, I would, um, I mean, I, I think it's important during this process of even individuals who aren't reading that much, uh, it's okay to listen to an audiobook. Uh, mm. Yet, personally speaking, uh, my it's it's deeper reading from an ebook or a book than an audiobook. It just it just it sticks more than than an audiobook or a podcast. Um, I mean, personally, I, I make sure that I read a, a fiction and a nonfiction, or or a sort of a of a book that gives me a, you know just shows me another perspective. And and I tend to enjoy reading an Arabic book and an English book at the same time. Mm. Yet one is fiction and not, one is nonfiction. Um, and sometimes I feel bored out of reading a certain book. And when I discover that the narrator in the audiobook is someone I want to listen to, so I switch to the audiobook due to biased reasons. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, uh, I'm going to recommend a book to everyone. Uh, I'm going against the grain here. Sorry, sorry, uh, Omer and Nora. Uh, it's We Are Completely Beside Ourselves by Karen Joy Fowler. And uh, that book changed, again, my whole perception of something. And I can't say more than that. And I would advise anyone not to read reviews before you read it, because there is a spoiler uh, about a quarter of a way through. And if you knew what the spoiler was, it would ruin it for you. So we are completely beside ourselves. A great title and it's a great book. And it's not one that many people have read, even though it was shortlisted, I think, for the booker a few years ago. Um, can we have one more? We've got time for one more poll question, please. And uh, it's been too short. So have you ever preferred the film version of a book you have loved? So um, 
I will ask our two uh, esteemed speakers today, but um, let's, let's see what our audience have to say. I think, Nora, you've already answered this. Uh, uh, no, 67% uh, oh. have never preferred the film version. So they're with you, Nora. And um, I think, Omar, you also prefer the film. No, the book, I'm sorry. Well, I I have to tell you of an experience I had. I went to uh, watch uh, a movie and I was in the cinema and I kept thinking, I know this story. Uh, and I, and you know, as time went by, I thought, you know what, I've discovered. They've plagiarized this entire script from uh, uh, an, a short story by, uh, a novel by um, Stephen King. Again, he pops up uh, for some reason tonight. Uh, and it turned out actually it was based on the Stephen King book and I felt like a true idiot. It was the Shawshank Redemption. Um, the film was excellent of course, and so was the book. And they did it in two different ways, but superbly. Ah, there we go, there we go. Yeah. So um, we are nearly out of time and I'm going to be handing over to His Excellency Omar Saif Gabash to say a few words to end our series of literary conversations against, uh, against borders and across borders even. <laughs> and I want to thank all of the speakers who have been involved in this. And I want to thank particularly tonight, you two wonderful people, what better way to end the series but having a discussion about literature and about great books. Um, it has been phenomenal, the amount of people who have joined us across the world. Um, one of the sort of un, un, unrealized, um, uh, probably benefits of COVID is uh, the switch to digital. So thank you so much, everyone who's tuned in. Thank you, Your Excellency Noral Kataby. I know how busy you are, so really appreciate it. And over to you, uh, Excellency Omar Saif Gabash, to take us out with a fanfare. <laughs> well, th thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Your Excellency Nora, thank you so much for being with us for the, for the final episode of, of this series. Uh, it really is an honor and it really is a pleasure to, to, to be in, in, in touch with you in this way. Uh, the COVID crisis has actually allowed us to connect in ways that we didn't know were possible. Um, and I, I think, you know, that we're, what we're doing here, what we've been doing over the last few weeks has been such, an, uh, in a way, a relief, in a way, a liberation from being locked up for, for, for so long. Uh, it's, um, it, this has been um, a uh, joint effort with uh, the Office of uh, Cultural and Public Diplomacy. Uh, we've tried to keep it low key. We try to keep out of the picture. But I do believe, um, Isabel, that this is the second time you've invited me on. Uh, and I'm assuming you're trying to curry favor with me. It's working 100%. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, and who better to curry favor with, uh, Omar, um, as a writer? And we had a question in which I didn't ask you asking yeah. about your next book. So I know you're busy on that. Uh, yeah, I can, I can actually see the pile of documents uh, just over to the left. Uh, you know, it's a start and stop process because you, you actually have to process a lot of uh, emotion as well. Um, and yeah, I, I hope to have it ready um, very, very soon. Uh, it should be a work of fiction um, and a, an exploration of a, a whole bunch of themes that I touched on in my, my first book. Thank, thank you for you. asking the question. Thank Thanks. you. And uh, thank you again to everyone and, and to the Office of uh, Public and Cultural Diplomacy. It would never have happened without His Excellency Zaki Naseba and your support, Omar Saif Gabash. Um, and uh, I have to thank Nora El Kaabi for introducing me to Leslie Hazelton. What an amazing <laughs> writer. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. And um, uh, uh, let's, let's see when we can do this again. But until then, everyone stay well, stay safe and keep reading. All the best from us. Thank you all. Thank you so Thank much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.